I am so excited for this video today. So back in January, I released probably the worst video on my entire channel where I ranked all the currently released blades. Long story short, it really sucked. It's the worst video on my channel and definitely not something I am proud of. Today, and over the next five days, I'd like to right that wrong. So I would like to present to all of you the updated blade tier list. So this is not just my opinion. I had a lot of help and a lot of input from many great players of a very deep understanding of this game. I think this is probably going to be the most objectively right list available, which is why I'm confident enough to use the word official. Now, I do have a couple disclaimers. First of all, the blades were considered based on their usefulness in many situations, as well as their strengths in specific situations. Raw results from challenge mode, missions, and timings in the base game were also taken into account. Each blade was examined carefully for what they can do individually and how they can contribute to a team. Secondly, just because a blade might be towards the bottom or the lower half does not mean that they are absolute trash. They're just heavily outclassed by the other rare blades and sometimes outclassed by common blades. It also does not mean that I or anyone else dislike them as characters. You can still use these blades and have plenty of success if you like them. Thirdly, also keep in mind that it is fine to disagree with me or other members in the community. As it stands, all tier lists or rankings could be inaccurate no matter how many people are working on them. Now before we get into this, I'd like to thank and credit all the people who helped me out majorly with this project. Firstly, to my friend Reyna, who has a very useful Discord bot called PoppyBot that acted as a great resource for compiling information for all these blades. Secondly, to Puro2, who is an artist who designed the infographics for all these blades and they look amazing. Next to everyone who helped me write all the text for these infographics and were major contr contributors to this project, Arashi Sora, Aberax, Sander, and Lawrence. These guys all helped me a significant amount so I didn't have to work nearly as hard. I'd also like to thank Cheaper Cheapest, RJL, Azixel, Zarandra, and A. L. Mao for contributing to this project directly. Finally, I'd like to thank Smalton and HyperT for indirectly contributing with situational input and useful videos that I myself have learned a lot from. I will be linking all these guys in the description to their channels or other relevant websites related to them should they want me to. So please check them out, support them, subscribe to them, and come hang out with us with the big Xenoblade Discord I will also be linking. Oh, and subscribe to me too if you like me. Now, let's finally get into this video. Each blade will have three slides that will stay on the screen for 10 seconds each before gameplay footage. Feel free to pause the video to see these more clearly. I'll also have external links for all of these infographics for a text-based list format. This time I'll be covering the blades from worst to best, and in this video we'll be starting with blades 41 through 51, which means we're going to be talking about the not-so-good blades. But I'm sure there will still be plenty of good things to say about them, so let's take a look at our first, or should I say 51st, blade. So we're going to be starting with Finch. On this list, this is where the start of E tier is. This basically signifies that these blades are either shield hammers, which is an awful weapon type, or they're easily outclassed by common blades of the same weapon type. Either way, there isn't really a great reason to use them. But, with that being said, Finch still has a couple things going for her. Her Did I Do That passive will instantly recharge all arts and specials 20% of the time. And if the stars align, this can allow you to spam level 4 specials for damage immunity and invincibility frames. You can even use these level 4 specials to stack fusion combos. And the more you're using specials, the more likely you'll be able to reset enemy cooldowns. Additionally, she has access to a topple art on Morag and a launch art on Zeke. She even has access to a shield art on male drivers as a form of damage reduction. However, Shield Hammer is just a terrible weapon type with awful animations, low ratio arts, and very long cooldowns. Her 1 aux core slot and 0 additives on her skill tree are not doing her any favors either, giving her the second lowest damage output in the entire game. Having a low damage output as a tank is never really a good thing. The point of a tank is to be able to generate aggro to be able to do your job as a tank. If you have low damage, you're not generating a lot of aggro, and if you can't generate aggro, enemies are not going to target you. If you can't tank as a tank and don't offer much besides that, what's the point? Additionally, her skill tree is mostly useless. Most enemy art cooldowns are already pretty low, so doesn't ring a bell is not very useful in that sense. Her did I do that passive is not going to be doing anything 80% of the time, and during the 20% of the time it does anything, it's not really going to be super impactful as far as making a difference in a fight. Her last special only works when you're targeting an enemy you have not even aggroed yet, and it only works for one attack, making it almost one of the most useless abilities in the entire game. This combination of low damage, a mostly useless skill tree, and inability to properly do her job as a tank makes Finch one of the worst blades in the entire game. So next up we have 
you guessed it, another shield hammer. So Electra suffers from a lot of the same problems as Finch. She has the same low damage output problem with the worst damage weapon class, along with no skill tree additives and only one aux core slot, but she doesn't even get the ability to recharge arts and specials occasionally, making her damage output the worst in the entire game. Electra does have a few additional positives going for her though. While she will struggle to pull aggro, she can function well as a decent wall if she somehow manages to get it, or if you swap to her on a character that already has aggro. She can reach the highest block rate in the entire game at 95% thanks to her skill tree, and can also have a 39% chance to completely block all damage with ultimate shield. She has the same access to topple, launch, and shield arts as Finch, and also has decent defenses. But her one aux core slot does hurt her quite a bit, because she can't even stack ultimate shield and block rate up. And once again, her damage is weak, and her aggro increasing passive is not as effective as a damage increasing passive would be for gaining aggro but it still somewhat helps her marginally. Counter spike damage is extremely negatable and not really a reliable source of damage. To add even more insult to injury, her specials are slow and some of the worst in the entire game. And while there's a lot to like about Electra in theory, the simple fact of the matter is that her weaker damage means it would be hard for her to pull aggro and function as a reliable wall or tank. And if you're looking for a pure wall who's very hard to kill, you're better off just using Poppy Alpha. Being a shield hammer in this game is really rough. So next up on our list, we have Dromark. So what does Dromark have going for him as a blade? Well, he comes early as a guaranteed story blade and he can heal. That's about it. At least he isn't a shield hammer, though. Twin rings actually have pretty good animations across the entire cast, but Dromark can only be used with Rex and Nia. Luckily, Rex has a very good twin ring set and twin ring clone set. But twin rings typically suffer from low critical rate and damage and not the greatest cooldowns. Dromark is the only twin ring rare blade, he doesn't exactly make the class worth using. We're very fortunate to have gotten so many great clones of the weapon. Dromark offers okay healing, but it's outclassed by bitballs, and to be honest, direct, heal direct healing isn't really useful the later into the game you are, so healers need to offer more than just healing ability to be useful. His specials aren't very useful with their low hit counts and damage along with mediocre effects, and his actual battle skills are just terrible. So his first one reduces blade combo damage by 50%. Now I want you to think back to the last time you were hit with a blade combo in this game. You can probably only think of a very few instances. And now I want you to imagine that you're actively controlling Dromark during this instance. Yeah, it's a completely useless ability. River's Blessing offers some okay sustain for the driver, but it's usually not going to be needed and easily outclassed by whatever direct healing Dromark already offers. Pile of Calm isn't really that useful, especially when you consider that Dromark should absolutely never get aggro with his weak damage. All in all, his really bad skill tree along with sharing a class with a common blade type means he can pretty easily be outclassed by any common twin ring that you pull from four crystals. Pretty much the only reason to use him is when you're required to use Nia and can't unequip him yet. His only driver combo access is also a mediocre break guard on Nia, so he doesn't really have the best utility there either. Overall, Dromark is an outclassed blade. So next up on our list, we've got Korra. Unfortunately for Korra, Girl power doesn't really translate into being a great blade. Knuckle Claws is a weapon class with a lot more going for them than Twin Rings and Shield Hammers for the most part, with fast animation, good ratio and artifacts, and a relatively high crit rate. However, Korra doesn't really have much going for her specifically to make her a great blade worth using. She has the same common strengths of all Knuckles, with good access to driver combos depending on the driver and a high critical chance, along with many attacks to gain party meter at a decent rate. She also has two aux core slots so she can actually have some fair damage output, especially compared to the other blades we've seen so far. But her individual skill tree and personal abilities just aren't that great. Being a Knuckle, her only way to heal are potion arts and whatever she has on her skill tree. In this case, only her level 3. Now healing isn't that important, but it is something worth mentioning. As far as her battle skills, hoarding potions isn't exactly a great way to heal up. It could have some synergy with cross set somewhat, but for the most part chasing around potions on the ground isn't really an efficient way to heal yourself or the team. Similarly for Walking Joy, if you're walking you're not doing damage or contributing in any other way and the percentage isn't really that great. She also doesn't really have much to offer a team besides hoarding potions, or offer anything besides healing output. Stop thinking also just isn't really that useful. 3 seconds pretty much lasts no time at all and there's nothing to really take advantage of in the moments the opponent is not moving, and it doesn't even stop an enemy already doing something, making it not really that great. Overall she has the same problem as Dromark where any common knuckle claw has a good chance of being a better blade to use. 
So rounding out E tier, we're going to finish up with a third shield hammer in Godfrey. Now I know what you may be thinking, and Nell, why is Godfrey not dead last? And the reason for that is because he's marginally more useful as a tank than Electra and Finch. His fierce fervor passive along with two aux core slots allows him to actually have decent damage output for a shield hammer, but that's still not great damage. Having the extra 80% and additional aux core can still go a long way. His specials even have damage boosting secondary effects, so he can get aggro much easier than the other shield hammers we've discussed so far. When he's under 30% HP, he gets 36% flat damage reduction, which can pair well with other forms of damage reduction to make him take virtually no damage even on the highest difficulties, especially with the shield art on male drivers. He also has decent access to two phases of the driver combo. However, Godfrey is still bad by virtue of being a shield hammer. His weapon class does him no favors, and even though his damage output is much better than Electra and Finch, he's still bottom 5 in the game. His awful critical rate makes self-sustenance really difficult, and his healing pass of under 30% HP directly conflicts with his damage reduction facet. Another issue with this is that it requires you to be under 30% HP for both of them, and it's never going to be a very desirable position to be in. His low damage output means he struggles to keep aggro, which is similar to the other shield hammers we've discussed so far, which means it's difficult for him to do his job as a tank. His specials additionally are pretty slow and often not worth using in many practical scenarios. All in all, Godfrey suffers from the same problem as all the other hammers, because that weapon class is just bad. It's unfortunate, but at the very least they look pretty cool. But as for Godfrey, he's still a bottom 5 blade. So this is where D tier begins. These blades are going to be less viable blades that may not be completely bad, but for the most part will still be completely outclassed by better blades. First up, we've got Rock, who is by far the lowest ranked attack blade. Rock's biggest strength is that he's definitely Vandom's best blade. That aside, he still does have a few things going for him that can be decently useful. The first thing is a relatively fast smash art on Rex. Smashes are pretty rare, so even having one is useful. His critical rate is the highest tier, so he can easily do crit heal strategies, and is one of the only three attack blades with evasion art that can make him completely immune to any incoming source of damage. These are all some decent positives, but they definitely won't make him a good blade. His rate of art recharge is probably the slowest among attack blades, and he has the third worst unconditional DPS among all attack blades, only beating Perun and Abrona. Both the additives on his skill tree are pretty bad, damage for only 30 seconds after a battle starts isn't great, and back attack is mostly useless because AI can't use it well, and player control can make even Rock have aggro. He's only useful in Ryberex, and his one niche of smashing has basically been overtaken by Corbin, who is a much more solid blade. His defenses are also some of the worst in the game, making him more prone to getting one shot. He doesn't even offer any kind of healing or tanking ability or any other unique utility whatsoever like all the other blades down this low. Overall, Rock really got the shaft in both story and gameplay, and there's virtually no reason to use this character on Rex over other options, not even for his smash arc anymore. Moving on to number 45, we've got Florian. Fitballs are a weapon class that are relatively weak as far as pure damage output, but actually have strong DPS on Zeke thanks to a free pull party heal every few seconds and a very spammable high cooldown art that can cancel into itself. Unfortunately, this isn't really enough to make them viable as a damage class or good enough to be useful. He has increased healing effectiveness and even restores the HP of the other two drivers if he ever dies. Now this sounds great in theory, but you don't ever really want your healer dying for any reason in the first place. Secondly, Florin doesn't really offer anything to a team outside of his pure healing power. And in a post-game where healing is mostly useless thanks to metals or other strong healing effects that on blades that offer way more, there isn't much of a reason to use him. His damage reduction passive is mostly useless because he's not going to be outputting a ton of damage to begin with, and his specials have pretty low hit counts, making him not the great in that aspect either. In endgame, his increased healing effectiveness doesn't really matter because all bit balls and a number of other blades should have easy ways to fully heal the party, not to mention that metals exist. Florin's lack of offering anything unique as a healer besides pure healing is the main reason he's the lowest ranked bitball, and bitballs in general still have a lot of problems with being viable just because of how the weapon works and what blades have the weapon. He has lower end damage output and no real access to driver combos either, which makes him unfortunately not the greatest blade. Continuing the bitball trend, we now have Bess. A lot of her strengths are basically the same as Florin, where she's pretty strong on Zeke for a strong party heal every few seconds and a low cooldown spammable art. She also has access to flat healing on the female drivers. 
With her 15% increased critical hit rate, she even has the second highest DPS of all the Bitfalls. But that's not really saying anything because all of them besides Cross Set have pretty weak damage. Her healing will still be serviceable and she can easily full party heal everyone just like Florin, but also like Florin she isn't really that great or useful outside of that. Space tea time can somewhat slow down potential damage output of enemies, but for the most part this isn't going to cause any noticeable differences. It also doesn't lower damage from actual moves and auto attacks, so you'll still be healing up after all of them, same as usual, making the lower effective damage over a long period not exactly that helpful. Additionally, her sympathy ability is pretty terrible. Most setups run Hunter's Chemistry to always start a max affinity, but even besides that, missing attacks to gain affinity isn't exactly a great trade-off. Her specials are pretty weak and low hit count too, so her chain attack damage and normal special damage is also going to be pretty weak. She's one of the only blades in the game to have zero and a defense stat, which also isn't good. And just like Florin, she has no access to driver combos besides a break card on Nia, which limits her utility and ability to help a team greatly. Overall, most of the bitfalls in this game have a lot of problems, and Vess is no exception. And if you thought that we were done with the bitfalls, then you would be wrong. The next bitfall on this list is Dahlia, who can get a slight damage boost against launched enemies and offer slightly more to a team compared to Vess and Floor. And while she can do a lot of damage spamming pulverizing dunk against launched enemies, that's not really going to be a significant reason to rank her higher than the other two, but her decent utility in chain attacks is. If she's selected, she'll hit all orbs next to the orbs she targets, which means she can quickly trigger full burst or damage multiple orbs at once. She also gives the entire team 30% additional critical rate, so she can function as a miniature critical symbol. This chain attack utility at least allows her to be useful to a team in some way, and she still also has the other strengths of the Bitball weapon class like easy full party healing. However, in most optimized setups, more orbs is actually bad and delays killing, so Spotlight isn't really going to be the most useful unless you want to quickly trigger a full burst for maximum damage bonus, which usually only happens if your damage is weak enough to not damage cap already. Launch is the weakest part of a driver combo, so getting extra damage against launch enemies isn't really that great either. Additionally, her single hit specials are actually pretty terrible in chain attacks, and oftentimes it would just be better to not use her even if she offers a little bit of extra utility there. Her utility outside of chain attacks is weak again, being limited to once again only a single break art on Nia. Overall her, overall, her utility isn't very useful with the type of kit she has, which ultimately doesn't make her that much better than either Vess or Florin, and she still suffers from all the same problems that got them ranked on the lower end. So as for Dahlia, she's not going to be the best blade to use. So now we finally move on to a different weapon. We've got Aegeon who is the lowest ranked katana on this list. Now Aegeon is a blade who doesn't really seem that bad on paper, but it doesn't really do much and as such is pretty outclassed. Pretty much all he does if you check his skill tree is dodge attacks. He's got an evasion art, he's got 18 seconds of pure evasion of everything when he gets to max affinity, he gets massive evasion at low HP, he gets massive evasion when moving, basically everything about Aegeon is all about dodging attacks. And with his supreme level of evasion, he is one of the easiest blades to build to make near unhittable with agility stacking and evasion orbs. He has a great critical rate thanks to the katana weapon class, and has some okay damage output thanks to that, and has pretty strong effects on all of his specials including his level 3 which is pretty easy to spam. Unfortunately for Aegeon, he has no additives and only two aux core slots, so his actual damage output is still going to be relatively low. You can't move and attack at the same time either, making evasion while moving not the most useful passive. Serene Heart only works once per battle, and it would usually be at the very start, thanks to Hunter's chemistry being run on pretty much everyone. Thanks to his lower end damage output, he can have a tough time pulling aggro to take advantage of his passive ability to invade, which means he's not going to function as well as a tank as you might want. Since he doesn't offer much to a team outside of his ability to evade, which doesn't really ever work if he can't get aggro, he is unfortunately not going to be the best choice or the best blade to use, and is pretty easily outclassed by the other katanas. Oh well, he might still be pretty good in Golden Country at the least. And rounding out this video at number 41, we have Ursula. Now it's a pretty common misconception that she's some broken healer blade, and even in the early days of the game I actually thought the same. But in actuality, she's not really that useful compared to a lot of other blades. Her main perk is healing on switch in, but this is only 40%. This is easily outclassed by so many sources of healing later in the game and also requires an accessory slot to actually be useful. So as such, she isn't quite as great as many may have been led to believe. My apologies if you finished her chart expecting a super broken healer. However, this is not to say that Ursula is terrible. She's got some pretty good things going for her. Her main use is a 60% party-wide barrier upon reaching max affinity. 
This will absorb all damage and reactions, allowing the party to not have to worry about anything but pure damage output for a while. Her level 3 can blow down enemies with every hit, and her heal being uninterruptible could still be clutch. She also has great access to driver combos depending on the driver, and a high critical rate and decent animations and ratios just like other Knuckles. Unfortunately, she only has one aux core, and her specials are fairly slow, so her damage output is easily the weakest of all the Knuckle Blades. Additionally, her healing is pretty much only useful player controlled, and she doesn't really offer much healing besides her heal on Switch. Aggro reduction does nothing for her basically since her damage output is already so low, and overall she's probably not going to be worth a spot on your team just to swap for a measly 40% heal. There's way too many better sources of healing, the damage barrier is far more useful reason to use her. And as an additional note, her affinity charts are the longest to complete, so there's not really a lot of great reasons to use Ursula. And that's going to cover it for this video. Please come back tomorrow to see the next part of this list. There's been a lot of effort put into this, and these are definitely not easy videos to make, so I hope they will be a useful resource to the community for years to come. If you learned something and enjoyed the video, please be sure to subscribe, like, and share with all your Xenoblade friends. If you disagree with the placement or have any additional input, feel free to let me know in the comments. Regardless, I hope you may have learned something from watching this video and are looking forward to the other videos as well as future content from Torna, the Golden Country. Thank you all so much for watching and have a wonderful day.